Hi, I'm Alice Bellet. And I'm Sam Ballaton Crimes. In this episode of Welcome, Victoria's Dead takes us back to Papua New Guinea. This is the second part of a two part episode, so we recommend going back and listening to the first if you haven't already. In the first part, we heard from Papua New Guinean families with really long and complex histories of interaction with Australians who aren't getting any benefit from the tourism associated with the Kokoda track. In this episode, we hear more from those who live near or work on the track. Kokoda is almost sacred to Australians, and thousands travel every year to honour Australian soldiers who died there during the Second World War. One of our former Prime Ministers, Paul Keating, even kissed the ground at a memorial there, breaking all kinds of protocol in an intense display of emotion. But Kokoda is no ordinary war memorial, right? Right. Australians travel there to do the hike over six to eight days. They have local porters carry their gear and they walk through and past the villages where Papua New Guineans live. Yeah, and these are Papua New Guineans who also have ancestors who died in that war. But these families don't have thousands of dollars to spend on a memorial hike. Instead, they get paid just a fraction of that if they're lucky enough to be a porter. Kokoda and the track has really charged meanings for Papua New Guineans as well as Australians. But these aren't always the same. Tori takes us to meet these people and get their take on what kind of relationship Australian and Papua New Guineans do and could have in the wake, not just of this period of shared wartime history, but a longer history that includes Australian colonisation of BNG. There is no any changes here. No good buildings, no development. Uh, there are people around the world know this name Kokoda here. But the people, original people, we can't see any changes in our place. The people are not changed. The living standard is not changed. We are just living the same. That is why my concern is. Welcome to Kokoda. On the left is the Kokoda station itself, main government office. Government train by here. We're going to the guest house. In 1992, Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating visited Kokoda in Oro Province, Papua New Guinea. His visit coincided with the 50 year anniversary of the Battle of Kokoda, a four month military campaign fought by Australian soldiers against Japanese forces in the midst of the Second World War. In front of a memorial for Australian soldiers killed in the campaign, Keating knelt down, kissing the ground at the base of the memorial stone. It was a conscious, deliberate act. Up until that point, it had been Gallipoli and the First World War that had dominated Australian national and military narratives. At Gallipoli, Australians had fought and died in staggering numbers under British command. In the Second World War, by contrast, in places like Kokoda, Australia fought as an independent nation. What Paul Keating was attempting to do, then, was to shift the centre of Australian national myth-making from the First to the Second World War, from Gallipoli to Kokoda. Yeah, and that's the uh, that's the monument he bent down and kissed, breaking the protocol. Protocol is not supposed to uh, bend down and kiss the for <laughs> uh, So uh, that stand. <laughs> Local historian and Oro Province man McLaren Hiari was there when Keating made his now famous gesture. But when he made a speech, he said, this was the place. Uh, this was the place uh, that were, that's forged the relationship between Australia and Papua New Guinea, between two races, two nations, two armed forces and people. In the years since Paul Keating's visit, Kokoda has become a site of intense, almost sacred national feeling for many Australians. It has also become a site of war tourism, 
with about 3,500 people, mostly Australians, travelling to PNG each year to complete the 96-kilometre Kokoda Track. This runs from Kokoda across the Owen Stanley Mountain Range towards the national capital, Port Moresby. It was on this track that Australian troops fought their gruelling, ultimately successful fight to prevent Japanese troops reaching and conquering Port Moresby. I think probably three times a day you know, on, on the trek. Yeah, we wow. stop and, and, you know, get told, OK, in this area, this is what happened. And, mm. um, but the, the, when, when we got to Brigade Hill, which is pretty high up and you've got fantastic views mm. looking out over the surrounding uh, countryside, we had sort of a, an Anzac Day type ceremony. So we had the last post music. Um, mm. There was reading of um, descriptions of the battles. Mm. Um, there was a few poems. That's Trevor. He walked for track about a year and a half ago. Like many Australian trekkers, he describes his experience on the track as both physically challenging and emotionally moving. We had the two flags, so the Papua New Guinea flag and the Spozzi flag, up on, on a sort of a makeshift post. Yeah, right. And we had to sing our national anthem and then the... The villagers, the Papua New Guineans, mm. sang their national anthem. And, you know, we had a minute silence as well. And mm. I thought that was, you know, really well done. We, we you know, had, the, had the actual music. And mm. Four or five of us um, read out stuff. So it was quite a, a moving experience. This is part two of Beyond Kokoda. I'm Victoria Stead. I'm an anthropologist and I've worked in Papua New Guinea over the last 13 years. I'm interested in how the Second World War is remembered in Oro province and in what kinds of relationships the past creates in the present. In the last episode, we heard from people living in Capricambo, a small village a couple of hours' drive from Kokoda. Like Kokoda, Capricambo was a site of fierce conflict during the war. But unlike Kokoda, Capricambo receives few visitors. And the community there watch as trekkers go to and from Kokoda and wonder why they don't come to their place. They describe themselves as being unrecognised and excluded from the benefits they imagine flowing to their better-known neighbours. In this episode, we go to Kokoda itself and hear from some of the people who live or work along the track. What we see is that even here, the benefits and the recognition that the tourism industry offers are uneven. I'm Edna Soma. I'm the head teacher at Kokoda Primary School. I'm from Ajeka village, from the Hunjera area, next to the Kumsi River, from this province. The school that Edna teaches at is at Kokoda Station. Kokoda was a colonial station long before it was a site of wartime conflict. Depending on which direction trekkers are walking, Kokoda is either at the beginning or the end of their six to nine day adventure. For trekkers, walking the Kokoda track means paying a company that will organise your itinerary, food and equipment. The vast majority of those companies are Australian as are most of the trek leaders who guide the groups. Papua New Guinean men, and sometimes women, work for these companies as porters, carrying supplies and the trekkers' bags. I feel it's good for those, for the youths especially, who are not engaged in anything, like making money for themselves. It helps them to make money for them and for their family. Also, when we had the trekking that started, um, communities along the trek and within uh, Kokoda itself had benefited. For many, particularly those from more remote villages in the central areas of the track, working as a porter is one of the few opportunities to secure cash income. Stella Harika is another local woman from Saga village. Yeah, it uh, helps the family, the whole uh, family. The husband, you know, like when he walks the track, the young men, they walk the track, come and help. You know, with the family's uh, livelihood. The trekking has brought uh, good things. Mm, yeah, 
has brought good things, but then it has also brought disadvantages. It's early in the morning at one of the two small guest houses at Kokoda Station. A group of porters are preparing for the arrival of a group of trekkers who they will accompany over the next six days. Most of the men are from the Koyari language group, from areas in the middle of the track, high up in the mountains. They began arriving yesterday afternoon, having walked the long distance from their homes to the station. They call it the marathon and do it in a fraction of the time it will take them when they return, with the trekkers, and laden down with bags. Tony Pahara describes what it's like working as a porter. A prison porter is like you'll be assigned <coughs> on the day you meet your trekker. You'll be assigned uh, that will be your your duty. Uh, it will be your duty. It, it will be your job to take care of him. <laughs> um, you'll be always by his side. Uh, if you needed the attention, you'll be always there. How many times do you think you would have walked the track now? I, I think I lost count. I was, I was probably doing, I think in my 50s, 60s, uh, I lost count. The last time I counted was probably around 50. It was probably around 2007, I think, seven or eight. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't tell you. I lost count, actually. Between March and November each year, small planes land at the tiny Kokoda airstrip several times a day. They deposit groups of trekkers about to begin their walk and collect those who walked in the opposite direction and are ready to head home. From the airstrip, the arriving trekkers walk the short distance up the single road that leads them past the Kokoda Memorial and its tiny one-room museum. They pull into the guest house, dropping their bags and relaxing on the lawn, while the porters unpack and repack their belongings. Before the group leaves, the guide gathers everyone together to introduce each trekker to the Papua New Guinean man who will accompany them. And Melton? Melton? The tough conditions of the trek mean that these relationships often, quickly, become close, at least for the duration of the walk. It is very good because um, uh, at, at the end of probably an eight-day trek or nine-day trek, you build a very, very, you know, very good relationship. You know, you get to know each other very well. It's through their personal porters that many Australian trekkers, most of whom will not have been to Papua New Guinea before, get a glimpse of life in the country. All right, OK. Where's Ben? We're ready to move them out, eh? Let's get on the track. Like Tony, Andrew Yauger works as a porter on the track. I'm kind of an adventure kind of guy. Hiking and, like, adventure is, is my interest and my hobby. So like I, I like doing that. And with interacting with the other, uh, the trekkers, uh, yeah, very interesting and really like some funny things happen. And I learn a lot with them. Maybe mostly some of the things that I don't know of, I learn from them. So yeah, that developed me a, much, I, a lot in that. So you enjoy those relationships? Yeah, I do enjoy that. I mean, the trackers that I come in. But it's also a tough job. Uh, yeah, it's like um, most of us, we do, uh, most of the companies should have from 16 kilos up to 16, 14 to 16 up to maybe 22 kilos, or less than that would do. But yeah, we do carry that, and it's, it's heavy. Like carrying he heavy weights um, on the track up and down the hills, in, I mean, this is not hills, this is mountains. It's quite really difficult yeah, doing that. While many companies have good relationships with the local people who work for them, others don't. 
There are ongoing grievances about porters being made to carry bags that exceed the maximum weight allowance of 22.5 kilograms. Other complaints centre on the pay that porters receive for each trip they complete, which is meant to cover the cost of their travel from their homes to the start of the trek and the cost of their return at the end. The company pays them and gives them, like, I actually interviewed some of the boys and they told me that they are paid at um, 800 bucks. That's 800 kina, or about 320 Australian dollars. Um, in that 800 bucks, it's like their, uh, their accommodation, their transportation, meaning their f- uh, plane fares to come back. So they get that 800 kina and to budget that, uh, they buy their own food. And then some of the stuff that they want to walk back because that 800 kina, it's, that, it's not that much enough for them to pay, uh, pay for the airfares. Many porters returning to villages along the track after a job choose to walk back home to marathon along the track rather than pay for a seat on a small plane in order to save more of their income. Even then, Andrew says, there's often not much left. Uh, they come back with like um, 150, 50 kina back in their pocket, which is really bad. And some, because of that, uh, they had to walk back. So when they, when they want to come back, it's like they, they give that 800 kina and they go buy their biscuit or any extra raisins that they can hold and come back. So when they come, they get their own transport and they pay their bus fares up to Owens Corner. From there, they just walk back. And I see that this is like they can come back with nothing. They do all that they can do on the track for the company. After that, um, the company doesn't recognize them. That's what I see. So it's, which is like it's disgusting to me. I would express it that way. Yeah. Tony Pahara is one of those who has called for a Porters and Guides Association to be formed. You know, the boys from the other side of Sogay, um, Port Mosby, and, and the boys from Makokora. Um, there was a talk that, you know, they wanted to set up a Porters and Guides Association. It hasn't been done. That association is what fights, that will, what, I mean, it will fight for the boys. Without it, Tony says, the porters keep their grievances quiet. So we seem to be silent most of the time. Some of the boys seem to be silent most of the time. You, you only, when they go back home, when they sit beside a fire, they will pour out themselves, they will pour out their hearts cry. But there's no one there listening. It's only themselves. When we have issues, we do our best. Not, I mean, it doesn't spill and the trekkers don't see it. We try to contain it within the group, talk it over within the group, make sure it doesn't spill, make sure there's no sign of it so the trekkers don't see it. So you just, or you maybe sing, sing some stupid song, you know, and make everybody laugh, you know, and then take your mind out, you know, that's what we do, you know, just to, just to take our minds off, <laughs> you know, of the pressure, you know. You, how much longer will you keep working on the track? Well, um, you know, we were joking last night and I said, uh, well, actually, before, yes, I used to hear whispers. <laughs> uh, my body used to whisper on every, every track. Um, he said, Tony, I'm tired. I want to quit. But now, actually, after a trek, it takes me, honestly, it takes me two weeks to recover. Um, and, and I can hear my body screaming. Um, I think I started when I, I was, uh, 20, was 24. Um, <clears throat> now I am 45. You know, nature always has limits, you know, and uh, I'm thinking of uh, quitting this, this year and, yes, doing other things besides trekking. Um, I'll see how my body goes. Along with the trekking industry, the growth in Australian interest in Kokoda has also brought with it increased attention from charities and philanthropic organisations. The not-for-profit Kokoda Track Foundation funds school and health initiatives. So does the Kokoda Initiative, a joint Australian PNG government partnership tasked with managing and sustainably developing the track. 
We heard from Edna Suma, the teacher at Kokoda Primary School, earlier. We've had, um, we have the Kokoda Trek Foundation that has come in, and for, for schools, they've helped to, can I one? They've helped to do some things like um, buying books and all this. The sponsored students from Kokoda area, especially Kokoda Trek Foundation, has to, uh, sponsored students from the primary school in the past, and when they went on to the secondary schools, they did go ahead to sponsor them. These are the kinds of benefits that communities like Capricambo, outside the circuits of the tourism industry, hope for. But even within Kokoda, many people also feel excluded from recognition and its promises. Justice Avari worked for many years for several of the Australian-owned trekking companies. Where are all these benefits? We don't benefit much in here. All these activities is taking place. It's just people driving in vehicles, flying in aircrafts, coming in and going. We haven't seen much of the development in here. Wilson Garisa also lives in Kokoda and watches the trekkers walk up and down the road that runs from the base of the mountains through the station. From my own point of view, especially like when you look at Kokoda itself, the world knows about Kokoda, okay? But Kokoda itself, the way I look at it, it's just like a rundown uh, station. To be honestly speaking, some uh, the trekkers or the tourists, they've asked me a few times I met them, and they said, where's Kokoda? And I said, well, welcome to Kokoda, you're in Kokoda. And it's very bit embarrassing for me to say a station like Okola, who is almost run down. As I said, this, this place needs to be beautified up, upgraded, like airport and all these roads here. What Wilson, like Justice and many others, would like to see at the station and along the track is development, transformation to the place and to their way of life. But here's the rub. What the trekkers come to see and experience is not development, but remoteness, a physical connection to the conditions of the wartime past. As trekkers walk the distance between the Kokoda airstrip and the beginning of the track, they walk past the house where Dorothy Day lives with her son, Barnabas. Hmm. Do you think the trekking industry has changed? Kokoda? No, I don't think. Nothing. What I'll say is they just come in and then fly out. They fly out, uh, fly in and then walk out. They won't have to stand and talk to the village people or visit the village people or houses, ask them how they feel about them walking or this. You know or what they eat, or they're happy to live like that, or they need anything, no questions. We just look there, look at them walking, pass by, go. I, every day I just say, good morning, welcome to Kokoda. Local people say of the trekkers that they come and they go. Many trekkers, too, comment on the relative lack of interaction they have with locals in the villages they pass through. This is Trevor. We heard from him earlier. Yeah, it's it's quite sort of quick. You you fly up, you stay the first night there, Mm. get up at 5am, get the plane up north, Mm. um, get back, back to Port Moresby, and then the next morning you're on the plane again. Stephen, another trekker, walked the track with his son. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, so you get up very early, mm. you know, your, your focus is on the day's walking mm. and um, and then your focus is on staying with everybody and, you know, you don't have a lot of time for interaction. Susan Jenga is a women's representative in the Kokoda Local Level Government Assembly. She says that this is hard for women, particularly, who have hopes of making some income by selling the fruits and vegetables they grow or the handicrafts they make to the trekkers and the companies that bring them. The trekkers, uh, they come and they land. When the potter gets them, they are gone. We just see them walking and we just say hello, that's all. We just say hello to them, that's all, and they are off. And we are seeing money running under our nose and going along this track. 
money, a lot of money is going, walking past me and going up, walking past women and going up and going back to Australia. There are no easy answers here. Some people say they don't want the trekking industry at all. Personally, I don't like it. You don't like it? I don't like it. Why not? Why? Uh, One is, it's not benefiting the community. That's McLaren Hiari, the historian we heard from at the beginning of the piece. Some people, like Wilson Garisa, have started calling for a road to be built, one that would allow villagers along the track to transport their garden produce to market instead of being reliant solely on the trekking industry for income. Like, we need to have a maybe road running along the side, the main road, not to disable the track, but just along the side, like going a uh, road going from uh, Kanadara up to Abuari, Abuari up to Mayolo or whatever, and then just go up to all the way to Mosby, and then grow vegetables there and supply Port Mosby and Poponeta. It's a contentious idea. Here's McLaren again. Well, I personally don't like a road road. I want the local, the track, to stay as it is. And it's a memory. It's a museum of the past, of our heritage, and of our military history. Both McLaren's own father and his father-in-law worked on the track during the war. And they have told their tales and uh, common common uh, comment is it's a hell track, valid track, but they worked on it together. They go, they helped their friends. Despite difficulties, hardship, and that uh, legacy needs to be kept. It can be only kept if we maintain that road and tell story. If we build road, that legacy is gone. Many people in Kokoda say that what they want is more involvement, more opportunities to participate more and deeper opportunities to connect with the trekkers they see walk by. Susan and other local women leaders have dreams of a resource centre where local women can market their fruits and vegetables and crafts to the trekkers. We're trying to get the attention. We have All this time we've been sitting down and seeing uh, money flowing in and flowing out, walking, unspent money is walking the trek and going back to Australia. So how we're going to get that money is to put some maybe coffee shop or maybe souvenir shop or maybe some sort of a very creative, you know, activities where they can stop and be in, to spend some time with the women. For all the good intentions and strength of feeling that coalesce at this place, the disparities of wealth and resources between Australians and Papua New Guineans pervade the relationships to which the industry gives rise. Many trekkers, as well as locals, grapple with what this means. Here's Stephen again. I think I was really struck by the the poor sort of... um, They were clearly still quite poor. Mm. (laughs) Because, you know, they... Well, maybe they're just used to getting around in thongs and barefoot, but, um, you know, very few of them wore boots, you know, Mm. They just wore thongs on the trek. There seems like a disparity between the money that Brendan and I had to spend to to be on the track and uh, what I thought was the poverty of the um, the porters. And I I actually think the PNG, Papua New Guineans view Australians mostly favourably, I think. Mm. Um, But I could be wrong about that. Maybe Mm. I got that completely wrong. Kokoda is a place of strong feeling for many, a place where different people, different hopes and understandings meet. In many ways, it is a place that exemplifies the relationship between Australia and Papua New Guinea in all of its complexity, 
difficulty and promise. Reflecting on his years working on the track, Tony Pahara says that one of the things that sometimes causes problems is when a trekker doesn't pay attention to the instructions of the porter. They don't listen when the porter directs them where to place their feet, or where and when to pause, or where to put their hands to steady themselves. It's in these situations, he says, when an incomer doesn't recognise the knowledge of the local person guiding them, that the trek becomes dangerous. They should listen, at least listen to the boys on the ground. Yes, they may think, uh, you don't run the show. But, I mean, I mean you, you, you don't have the logistics, you don't have the money, you know, you don't have the knowledge. But we experience the job. You know, on the nine day, on the eight day, we experience how tough it is. But it's also in listening and learning that new possibilities for connection emerge. I think it's the hardship that you go through together that you become a very good team. You know, it's, it's, a, it's how you associate, it's probably how you relate to each other, how you open up to each other. And sometimes that bond and that uh, relationship even carries on after the trek. The Welcome podcast is based in Nam on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Nam is also known as Melbourne, Australia. This episode was produced and recorded by Dr. Victoria Stead. Script supervision and editing by James Milsom. The music composed by John Bartley. Special thanks to Tony Pahara, Andrew Yalga, Margaret Mbahe, Mavis Manuda Tonjia, Drida Ambre Punya, McLaren Hiari, and Professor John Wyko. If you like this show and haven't already, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes or wherever you listen to us. It helps spread the word about the show and we really appreciate it. <laughs>